Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Spring Webinar Program. Uh, my name is Peter Humphrey. Uh, as always, your, your MC and host, um, working in Spring uh, Product Marketing and Cloud Foundry Product Marketing for uh, Pivotal. Um, I am very excited to introduce our speakers today uh, from Couchbase. Um, actually, I think it would be better for them to introduce themselves. Matt, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, I'm Matt Ingentron. I'm a, a Senior Director in Engineering here at Couchbase, looking after mainly the developer uh, interfaces, things like SDKs and connectors. Hi, I'm and Sudhashni Sudhashni. Balakrishnan. Um, I work on the Couchbase Java client and a little bit on the uh, Spring Data Couchbase as well. Uh, right before we joined the webinar, uh, Matt and I were joking that um, we, we stole, uh, you know, Pivotal stole an a, a excellent employee from, from Couchbase, uh, Simon. Um, and, you know, there's just been a lot of work going on together uh, with the Spring Data team and the Couchbase team uh, lately. And with the, you know, release of uh, Spring Data K sort of, you know, pretty imminent, um, wanted to get you on the webinar to, to the program to show everyone um, what you've been doing uh, with the Spring Data team and, and what's going on with Couchbase. So uh, really excited to have you here. Let's, uh, let's, let's dive into it. Thanks much, Peter. Appreciate it. So uh, 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 what I'm going to cover today a little bit is kind of give you an intro to reactive programming that's probably already familiar to some people but might be new to others, uh, but what we see is important about it. Then we'll talk a little bit about building a reactive repository with Spring Framework uh, 5. Uh, then we're actually just going to do it live, and then we'll talk a little bit about how uh, that came together and some of the next steps. So. Uh, First off, a little bit about reactive programming. Uh, I actually come from a, a project called Memcached. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, and uh, probably around, I don't know, 2005, 2006, the idea of uh, doing event-oriented programming uh, became a lot more popular. As a matter of fact, we did that a lot in uh, Memcached uh, through LibEvent. Uh, and uh, some of that, uh, some of those concepts have carried forward in Couchbase's architecture, and now. We're at a place where the entire software development community is moving forward with this desire to have uh, reactive interfaces uh, and, and design code in a reactive way. So much so that there's even a uh, group of people or, and a website called the Reactive Manifesto. And what the Reactive Manifesto lays out is this, this idea that if, when you're designing applications to be reactive, you really need to kind of design them uh, or such that they are responsive, resilient, elastic, and message-driven. So by responsive, what we mean is things like the system responds quickly. I always think of that as if I, as a user, tap something on my phone and it doesn't respond right away, I'm probably going to be distracted by a notification and I'm gone. And so uh, we as software developers need to kind of design our entire system to meet that user expectation. It lets us build a more engaging experience for those end users. Um, and have a, a much more consistent uh, quality of service. We need those, these things to be resilient. Uh, so if we componentize them and make sure that uh, clients of other components within the system are abstracted away from failures and that data is replicated, which is kind of core to us at Couchbase, uh, then that entire system can stay resilient. You can have a system that stays uh, up 24 by 7, uh, 365 days a year, uh, that can even uh, go across upgrades as we do in, in Couchbase, uh, which is you know, not, not a, a small trick when you're talking about persistent data. We also want these systems to be elastic. We want to make sure that they stay responsive under varying workload, that we allow the addition of resources without the interruption of the existing workload. Uh, so the ability to add and remove nodes to a cluster, uh, for example, is one of the things that we do in, in, uh, in Couchbase. And then uh, for you as an application developer, what we do through Spring Data Couchbase and the Java SDK is you're abstracted away from that detail, kind of going back to the, to the resiliency. So if you add resources to the cluster, you don't have to make any changes at the application layer. You don't have to reshard. Um, and then probably uh, most important here, especially if you're talking about a programming model, is that it should be message driven. So rather than uh, writing a set of imperative code that describes the order in which to do things and blocks from time to time, you turn the model around and you write code that is reacting to the other code that might be executing inside the system. Uh, I.O. in particular, whether it's network I.O. or disk I.O., tends to be the tall pole in the tent 
And by changing the model, we can actually make the system a lot more efficient. Uh, and we can use uh, concepts like back pressure to make systems that are able to degrade gracefully as uh, you add additional workload to them. Um, by being uh, non-blocking and only consuming resources when active, you reduce overhead dramatically. And so that actually enables us to do some pretty interesting things with uh, whether it's cloud or virtualization or containerization, or even now uh, these days uh, people are, are, are starting to deploy these kinds of things in um, Lambda type architectures or serverless type architectures. And you need that efficiency to be able to get there. Just one really good example. I, I like to show this as an example of where we came from and where, where we're going to. So we've always, uh, at Couchbase, we, uh, we've always had an asynchronous interface. Uh, it's you know relatively new for a lot of the other databases, but we've, uh, since inception, we've all, always had an asynchronous interface. And back in 2006 or so, um, when uh, in the Memcached project, prior actually to even the founding of Catchface, we did this with a what you, if you looked inside Java, what you would find is Java Util Concurrent Futures. And so, you, if uh, just as an example, if I were if I wanted to off of a future uh, look up a blog post, uh, in this case that uh, the key for that document is uh, posts colon colon one, and then retrieve the set of comments that are referred to in that blog post, I might write code that looks a little something like this. This is obviously pretty modern because it already has a lambda in there. Uh, but I, I'm uh, writing something that is a callback. So I'm going to asynchronously get posts one. And then I'm going to add a uh, callback that uh, uh, listens on the future. And then when the future is done and it's not canceled, then I'm going to do an asynchronous get retrieve the IDs uh, from the uh, content for the comments. And then I write a for loop to say, well, from zero to the number of IDs, uh, I'm going to get the top five IDs. Uh, but I, I even have to write this uh, code a little carefully to make sure that, well, what if there are only three IDs? I want to make sure I don't uh, get there, go above, uh, I, that, I, that I break uh, before that. Um, and uh, then I, I will uh, then asynchronously go get those documents themselves. So you see that this is really one async get followed by five more async gets. Reasonable code. Uh, anyone who's ever tried to write uh, code with uh, Java object futures, you know, the challenge is you, you run into all kinds of issues with uh, being able to kind of read this uh, sort of stair-stepping code potentially uh, better with the Lambda in this case. Um, but uh, you also have challenges with things like, how do I do error handling? In a reactive case, instead, uh, this is an example using RxJava. So we introduced this, I think, about three or four years ago now. Um, so the, uh, we, we had worked with uh, a project called RxJava, which had come out of uh, Netflix. In fact, we shipped uh, RxJava prior to, to it's even 1.0, and now we're tracking with what's happening with Reactor. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But this same bit of code, uh, expressing it in reactive uh, asynchronous programming, you, you, you'll see that off of the bucket, bucket is a, uh, an object in Couchbase that kind of represents a collection of documents, I can get post one. And then I can map a function over that that says get the comments, get the uh, comments array out of that. And then I can flat map a, another uh, function over that that uh, converts those comments to the list, to a list just take the top five of those. And there's a little bit of a you know, defensive programming. Make sure that they're strings. Retrieve those, uh, those comments themselves. Retrieve those other documents. And then turn it back into content and write it out at the line. Now, not represented here, but uh, you can see this is a lot more uh, expressive, a lot easier to read. Uh, this fluent interface is a lot easier to understand what's happening. So I'm getting the posts, then I'm gr grabbing the top five, and then I'm printing them out. The other thing that isn't necessarily represented in this code, but is uh, really important, is that uh, re modern reactive programming interfaces also give me things like the uh, ability for the system underneath to signal back pressure, the system underneath to be able to uh, do error handling in a much better way, rather than you know, Java checked exceptions that I have to wrap around my Java object features. Um, and by uh, back pressure in particular, if that is part of uh, an overall reactive architecture, such as is in Spring Framework 5 and Spring Data uh, with uh, the K release, then you can actually build a system that is really efficient uh, and 
uh, very capable of you know handling lots of load and degrading uh, in a in a very reliable way with a high quality service. So what have we done uh, here with uh, Spring Framework in Spring Framework Five? So uh, Couchbase has been working with Pivotal on uh, on Spring Data Couchbase for a number of years now. Uh, Spring Framework Five, uh, I'm sure the, the you know there's a, uh, a lot of you are already familiar with, but it, it provides uh, components for a reactive programming model. And then underneath that, there's Spring Data, which provides a reactive repository interface over a Spring Data defined model. So Sebastian is going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But uh, as you would with any other Spring Data application, you define your model. You can then define a repository. And then you can interact with that repository uh, in your, your Spring uh, application itself. Um, then there's the, uh, underneath that, the magic that we've put together is, uh, so Spring Data is built on the Reactive Streams uh, initiative. So Reactive Streams is a, uh, an open standard for asynchronous stream processing uh, with things like non-blocking back pressure. And it's supported by a number of different um, Reactive implementations. Reactor, uh, which is, uh, um, has uh, kind of come out uh, with Pivotal's backing, uh, Rx Java, both Rx Java 1 and Rx Java 2, even Java 9 uh, in uh, Java 9's uh, Flow uh, API is going to start supporting a reactive streams interface. Uh, and in the S Spring Framework 5 and Spring Data case, it uses Reactor Core, which was authored by, by uh, Spring, by Pivotal. Under that, we have a set of components. So any, anybody can, have a, a, can import a component, uh, a general component that uh, conforms to the reactivestreams.org uh, specification. We would have a publisher, subscriber, a subscription, and processor uh, interfaces that it may define. And Spring Data Couchbase does that through uh, its interface into a, a spring in, in a Spring Data application. So what you'll see in a little bit is that I can consume something that looks like it's Reactor, it's Flux or Mono, but it, underneath it's actually using uh, the, um, uh, the interface that, that Spring has given us. And uh, we do all of that, all Reactive end-to-end, -end, all the way down through the uh, Couchbase Java client. So, let me give you a sense of how that looks. Uh, in, a, uh, in the Couchbase uh, Java SDK, what, you, what you're seeing here is up at the top, you have this uh, situation where you're expecting to uh, find by first name a person and return that as a flux interface. And so flux interface is uh, n number responses. And that, uh, that call goes into the Java SDK. Within the Java SDK, uh, what we have is we have a, a, a core where we basically uh, schedule onto a ring buffer a, uh, that request itself and immediately return an observable stream. Now that observable stream is then converted back into an interface that you expect through uh, Spring Data. Within the uh, Java SDK, what we do is then uh, we have to look up the node on which that particular document needs to come from. Uh, go uh, put the request together, uh, send the I.O., and then we actually use another layer of reactive I.O. underneath, which is Netty. So we'll do non-blocking I.O. to the appropriate node within the Couchbase cluster. Once we get that response back, then we're able to feed it back to that observable stream. Uh, but we actually go a step further. So as I mentioned, uh, we've been doing reactive programming basically since the beginning. And that even happens on the server side. So in, uh, so in, in the case of using uh, Spring Framework 5 with Spring Data K, you actually have end-to-end -end uh, end -end reactive architecture. So the uh, Couchbase core would uh, create a request uh, and, and queue it on that ring buffer, return that observable, just like we were talking about before, but just chasing that netty request. The netty request goes over to uh, a, um, a, a, uh, a component within the Catchphrase server uh, that then takes that request. And what it does is it will do a lookup uh, through our non-IO, uh, through a non-IO component. And we call it that because we uh, run a, set, a thread pool uh, very efficiently to handle those non-IO events. Look up the item or any metadata associated with the item. 
uh, if the data is already in a memory cache, then it gets returned right there immediately. And so what that means is uh, for documents that are uh, directly accessible, we can actually return those basically at, at, at line rate, uh, well under a millisecond in many cases. In the case that we actually have to retrieve it from disk, then we'll uh, propagate that request to a, an I.O. layer, an I.O. component that will then schedule I.O. Uh, to go retrieve the item from disk. Uh, once it's complete, it will notify completion back to the, um, to the front end, uh, and then that will then propagate uh, across the network back to the mini channel and back up to the observable. So what you're actually seeing in this case is everything is end-to-end -end reactive. And it shows itself through the system being very efficient and, uh, and very, very quick. So uh, with that, I, we want to uh, ask you, you folks a question. We have a poll for you. So the uh, question is, which reactive programming framework do you prefer? And we're just curious which one that you've been using. Is it RxJava 1, Reactor, RxJava 2, Java 9 Flow? Uh, or do you only react to, or are you not reactive yet, you just react to bugs in your code? This is interesting to us, uh, so uh, we're, we're putting uh, plans together for how we handle this in the uh, future uh, with uh, the Catchbase Java client. You know, we're RxJava 1 based currently. We think we have an approach for what we're going to be doing in the future, but we're kind of interested to see what people are using out there. So it's looking cool. like, ooh, more than 50% not reactive yet. <laughs> Uh -huh. Well, then yeah. this is the right webinar for you, right? That's right. That's right. You are in the right place. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rx Java, is Rx Java 2, what, what's the timeline on that? Is, um, uh, I Sebastian thought, would probably know off the top of her head. I think yeah. that's looking like next year. Is that right, Sebastian, or later this okay. year? Oh, yeah. Okay. So late this year. So uh, thanks, Matt. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, reactive uh, couchbase Java Point API. Uh, so as Matt mentioned, we have, uh, we have it um, since like for three or four years, and it's already available for use in the Spring Data Couchbase uh, Ingalls and Hopper release frames. Uh, Spring uses names for versions, so Ingalls refers to a 2.2 uh, two version, and Hopper refers to the 2.1 version of the Spring Data Couchbase. Now with K, which is the 3.0 version, uh, we have also added support for the reactive uh, repository and template as well. And then we'll see a little bit about uh, how to build a, a full stack web, web reactive application using Spring Data Couchbase and Spring Webflux. So uh, let's start off with the uh, reactive uh, programming model. Uh, the reactive programming model consists of a publisher and a subscriber component. So a publisher is basically a provider of data. Uh, uh, it can emit either a single value or a sequence of values, or it can be an instant stream. And the subscriber is the one which consumes the data. And this is basically a push-based model as opposed to the blocking pull-based model. So in the older pull-based model, you would need to uh, send a thread for each request so that the thread is going to be blocking waiting for data. And this is not going to scale very well because uh, sending a thread for each request is going to be uh, expensive. And whereas in the uh, push-based model, you can scale effectively using a uh, small number of threads. And the uh, publisher subscriber standards have been really uh, done, uh, are, are specified in the reactive stream uh, specification. And there are a number of uh, reactive uh, extensions for JVM available, as not mentioned for the uh, RxJava, Reactor, Java 9, uh, Flow API, and uh, Aka Streams. Uh, so here we're going to focus more on the uh, RxJava and Reactor. Uh, in RxJava, the uh, reactive uh, uh, publisher available is called uh, Observable. We are using RxJava 1, so it's called Observable there. RxJava 2 also has it available. So it could uh, emit uh, um, a single value or a sequence or an infinite string summary. And uh, if the uh, push base doesn't often iterable. Uh, whereas Reactor has two types, the mono is a single value emitter, and the flux is uh, very uh, similar to observable. Uh, so in our uh, couchbase Java client, we actually expose the uh, API with uh, the observable. So let's see an example of how the API looks like. 
here, uh, in this uh, example, I'm using the uh, uh, asynchronous bucket interface. Uh, bucket and cache space is basically a collection of uh, documents. And here, uh, the, uh, I'm fetching a document uh, with the document ID Walter. So it's going to do an asynchronous get, and then I'm doing a flat map. Flat map is an operator which transforms the series of variables and then merges uh, the sequence, uh, merges it into a single sequence. Uh, here we are going to transform uh, the response from the get and change the uh, document with the H property to be uh, 52, and then do a replace. So the emission from our flat map is going to be the response of the replace. And then the subscriber here is pretty simple. It's just going to print out the uh, response from the replace. So this is how you could uh, use the uh, 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 React API in the Couchbase Java client in the older Spring versions like uh, Ingles and uh, uh, Hopper. Now with K, uh, we have added support for the uh, reactive template. The reactive template is basically an extension of the uh, the Couchbase Java client. It's still going to emit the observables. Uh, but it's nice that uh, you have both in, uh, uh, both in functions to transform the uh, re response back into your entity. Uh, so here, uh, uh, in this particular example, find by ID or, or save, uh, whatever JSON document response you're going to get back, it, it's going to be mapped back to your entity. And this is not very sophisticated. With, uh, with what we get with the repository is like the query derivation and so forth. So uh, we also added support for the reactive repository. We'll see how it looks like. So uh, there are two re reactive repositories available in Spring Data, uh, reactive cron repository and reactive uh, threading repository. They have both implementations with Spring Data Couchbase. Uh, here in this particular example, we're going to look at the reactive sorting repository, which also has, uh, uh, you can also do pagination and sorting with reactive paging repository. Uh, the first, uh, we're going to use the uh, person repository uh, here. And uh, uh, with custom methods, we do query derivation. So the first method here, uh, find the first name, takes in a parameter first name, and it's going to get converted into internally into a nickel query and sent to the Couchbase server. Uh, so it's going to become a uh, select uh, star from uh, your bucket, couch face bucket. Uh, excuse me. Hmm. Uh, There's sorry. Connection. Uh, Let's, you, I hear you fine, Sebastian. You can see it, I think. Well, I'm making it a restart. Sorry about that. I'll log back in. Oh, OK. Uh, oh, so, so well, Sebastian has lost uh, her connection here. I'll talk to this for a moment. So the, the idea here with the reactive repository is that uh, the uh, uh, Spring Data and Spring Data K provides this reactive repository interface. And then we implement those two interfaces. What you're seeing in this particular uh, code example on the screen uh, in the find by first name and last name there at the bottom of the screen as an, exa as an example, that actually is doing query derivation. So if I were to literally type out find by first name and last name, provide the parameters first name and last name, Spring Data Couchbase will know how to turn that into the query and retrieve the uh, appropriate uh, POJOs that map to the model that's also in my Spring Data application. Uh, just okay. to contrast that, uh, it, uh, I'll uh, just uh, contrast this really briefly, Sebastian. Just to contrast that for a moment, in the reactive template case, uh, really here you're specifying uh, a POJO that maybe you, you may have defined, a, a particular class that you would have defined. Uh, so it's flexibility. You have the ability to either uh, use the model as defined by uh, Spring Data, or you have the ability to uh, you know, work with the reactive template and use some of the uh, lower level uh, implementation. You always have the ability to kind of dive down a little lower. I'll hand it back to you, Sebastian. Okay. Uh, thank you. So let's, let's see how to build an application that uh, the uh, reactive uh, uh, repository mentioned before. And we're going to be using uh, Spring WebFlux, which is available as uh, Spring Prima 5. Uh, so it's going to be using Reactor Core underneath, and we're going to use uh, Spring Data Couchbase for the reactive data access. Uh, so 
the exam the application we're going to build is called the uh, activity uh, tracker application. So imagine that uh, our users are going to be having variables which track their heart rate, and we're going to infer uh, if they're doing an activity based on their heart rate, and we're going to store it into our couch base bucket. So the activity tracker bucket here is used to store the user information, uh, like the number of minutes they're active. And the application itself, you're going to build it using uh, Spring Boot, uh, which is uh, using uh, Spring Framework 5, uh, Spring Data 2.0, and Spring Data Couchbase 3.0. And to make it a little more interesting, we're going to have uh, two endpoints, the leader and leader screen. Uh, leader is the person who has the highest number of active minutes, and leader screen is going to emit the uh, leader every second. So let's see how we can build it. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. So um, if you go to if you go to uh, Spring Initializer IO, you should be able to pull in these starters. So I have already have them here. Um, it's using the 2.0 milestone here uh, for Spring Boot, and the starter for Spring Data Cache Base is going to pull the uh, 3.0 milestone four, and we're going to use Spring Flux as well. And using a long box here for uh, minus twelve and uh, our Rx Java reactive streams to do the conversions between our uh, uh, spring uh, reactive template. The so spring reactive template uses uh, uh, an observable, and I, for the repository, we are actually exposed it as flux in mono. So the reactive streams is actually a, a converge between the publishers. And now um, let's say we, we go ahead and create the uh, bucket in our Couchbase server. I'm logging in to <coughs> Gosh, we, Bushing, we don't see you log in. Might be on the other screen. Oh, I am. Um, I don't see it. I think it's frozen. Yeah, what we're seeing on the screen is uh, IntelliJ, and you're in the uh, XML uh, properties. Right. Um, while she's doing that, uh, there was one, que one question from the audience, Matt, um, <clears throat> uh, sure. that maybe we could speak to you for a moment while, while she's getting that sorted out. Um, the question was, is there any performance overhead um, between using a reactor versus a template approach? No, actually. Uh, so the good news is that whether you're using a uh, reactor or the template approach, the uh, reactive components underneath are uh, exactly the same. The POJOs uh, that you're un unpacking the JSON into have about the same serialization overheads. So there's nothing uh, in particular that would make one um, you know, more performant or less performant than the other. The one thing I might mention is that, uh, but this is true with either uh, uh, Reactor or with the template approach, is that uh, sometimes you can dive down to some of, as, as you'd imagine, you can kind of dive down to some of the lower level details uh, within the Couchbase API beyond the, uh, the magic uh, that Spring Data and the, the repository, uh, the Reactive repository supply you. Uh, and uh, use some low-level uh, kinds of things. A good example of that would be uh, sub-document uh, support. Uh, so sometimes uh, you, with uh, Couchbase, you can actually serialize or put together a, a set of operations that you want to do on, an, uh, on a document and serial and execute them. Uh, and uh, that would allow you to, um, uh, to really be efficient uh, at that level. But uh, you know, that's only when you're kind of looking for that, that last mile. Hope that addresses that question. Gotcha. I think I think so. Um, uh, looks like we're having a little bit of trouble with the screen share at the moment. But um, there was one other question uh, uh, about where you know, basically I think you kind of addressed this though, Matt, um, earlier uh, in talking about were, were you moving off RxJava 1.0? You know what, what's your yeah, so going to be to that? 
you know, in the future. Sure. I think you hit that already, right? But anyway. Uh, not exactly. Um, there, so it's a great question because, uh, for those who don't know, uh, so RX Java 1 is, has been around for uh, quite a while, and there's a, uh, looks like we're back. Uh, I'll just uh, finish answering this super quickly, um, and we can talk more about it. But RX Java 1 is going end of life at some point. Uh, and so that uh, that means that we have to evaluate moving RX Java 2 or Reactor. Uh, and uh, let me let Sebastian go ahead, and I can give you a, a little bit more more of a sense of what we're going to do here at the end of the call. Cool. Uh, so okay. Thanks. Here, uh, so here, I'm going to create a bucket called Equity Tracker. Okay. And I'm going to create a primer index for this particular bucket. So create primer index, and you can run it through our UI, which is pretty nice. And on the index list, you should be able to see the primer index created. OK. Cool. So now uh, we're going to connect to this particular uh, bucket using our Java config. site. So here, the configuration extends from the uh, our reactive Couchbase configuration provides the uh, host name and uh, the bucket information, the bucket name, and the password. And now here, our uh, data model is going to be uh, the user. User is going to have an ID and first name, last name, uh, active minutes. Uh, we're going to load some users. Let's say we're going to load two users here, John and Dave, their uh, username. And their initial active minutes are going to be zero. And we're going to do a save all. The save all here uh, is using the repository. The repository is actually extending from the reactive uh, Couchbase repository. And save all is already an implemented method, so you need to just call that. Uh, and I'm doing a subscribe so that it, it comes, uh, it's completed. It's, it's converted into a blocking uh, call. And uh, we're going to do a flux uh, interval. So for every second, we're going to uh, randomly create, uh, heart, we're going to randomly generate heart rate. And based upon the heart rate, we're going to increase their yeah, active minutes. So let's say if they have a heart rate higher than 120, we're going to add it as an active minute. So we don't increment it. I'm using a subdocument operation here. So it's just going to uh, access that particular property of the document and go to update it. And Let's see uh, if we can uh, add some, something more to this. We wanted to add the leader. Uh, we want to find the leader uh, among the uh, people among the, among our users who have the highest number of active minutes. So for that, um, I just need a single user. I'm going to use a mono user, and to find uh, the uh, top one, I'm going to use a custom method. Find top one by active minutes greater than. So our leader should have at least one active minute. So that's why I'm using uh, greater than. I'm going to pass in the parameter for the active minute uh, as zero. Greater than uh, order by active minutes. And now in our risk controller, this is actually using the uh, Spring uh, web plus, which is reactive. Uh, we're going to use an instance of our, our repository. Uh, so I'm going to use Autobuy user repository. Now uh, we need to create a mapping for leader and client. So do a get mapping. While Subhashini is typing that up, so that repository uh, implementation is provided by Spring Data Couchbase uh, as the user repository. So that was that. Ah. Uh, okay. Connecting to the appropriate bucket. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, yeah that's helpful. Uh, now we're going to call the repository method, and we're just going to pass in zero. Um, so let's see. Um, so we'll try to run this application here. And while that looks like a super long method name, and it is, <laughs> the, uh, the magic there is uh, Spring Data Couchbase is deriving what the query should be based on the model in the application and the repository's implementation. So you don't oh, have Matt. to write a query. We, we don't do long method names here in Spring. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> No, no, we are not guilty of abstract proxy factory 
Flat <laughs> <Yeah>. news. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Win in Rome, Funny. right? Win in Java. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So now let's try to hit that inform for leader here. Okay. It's running on 8080. Right. Well, while the method okay. name is long, the code is, this is, there's not much code you've had to write here. I mean, this is pretty, yeah, exactly. pretty abbreviated. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you can see the, the nickel query actually generated by that method. So it's going to so like meta ID, cast information, and all the properties of the user here from the activity tracker and where the activity is zero, greater than zero. And this class information is actually useful for tracking a particular repository. And you're going to do an order by, so you don't really need to write these long queries. You can, you can use custom methods and the query of these later. Right? And um, so now we have a leader which just uh, which is which is very interesting. We just get a leader. Uh, we just need to make a call every time we need to get a leader. So let's say we want to do a stream. We want to get a leader every second. How would we go about doing that? We're going to use uh, another endpoint. So if I were, say, using React.js or something like that on the front end and I want to update the UI on a regular basis or maybe it's a mobile app or something, I'm, I'm looking to see who, who between Dave and, and John is most active and I want to know every second. That's what you're doing here. Yeah, it's going to produce a uh, data in all of you. And we're going to listen to Flux. There's the first stream every second. There's stream. And the difference here is Mono is Reactor's single uh, result, and Flux is its multi result, effectively, correct? So uh, we're going to use a flux interval. Uh, it's going to emit a tick uh, for every second. Uh, let's say duration a second one. And we're going to flux map it. So we're going to transform it into the uh, result from the uh, rep repository method. It's going to be versioning a mono. Um, yeah. So it's going to emit a sequence with this mono as so a flux. Um, so now let's try to run the application again. <coughs> if you can make the terminal a little larger, Sebastian, when you yeah. run it this time. Oh. Not that kind of larger. The command, um. command shift plus one. There we go. Okay. So here is all the leaders train endpoints. Okay, cool. So now it's uh, emitting a leader for every second. Um, so yeah, it's internally calling the nickel queries uh, per second underneath the layers. Uh, so now we saw how uh, we can build a reactive application using uh, uh, Spring Data Cache and Spring Notebook. So we'll see how the internals work. Let's go back to our slide. Very cool. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. I think that that whole app was basically in a single class, right? Yeah. <laughs> So here, um, when the request actually hits the uh, uh, Spring Boot application, it's processed by the Spring Flux, uh, Spring Web Flux, which is using, uh, which can be using either Netty or Serverless V1 or any other uh, non-blocking I/O framework uh, to handle the request. And uh, after the request passes through the Spring Web Flux to the Spring Data Cache base, uh, it, it's going to use uh, Netty again uh, to communicate with the uh, uh, Cache base server. And the request are processed internally using an LMAX disruptor. An LMAX disruptor uses a lot of, has a lot of uh, optimizations for synchronization. It's, it's, it's almost like lockless. So that's why we use an LMAX disruptor for the uh, ring buffer. And after the request uh, hits the uh, crush base server and returns back, we get the response back and push it up to the uh, spring web flux, which returns the response back. So 
the Springwood application internally also uses the reactor for being reactive. Uh, so this is a this is a request response flow to the application. Um, so summary, uh, we we saw the uh, reactive concise reactive programming um, and with math. Uh, so uh, it's, it's easier to handle errors that reactive programming is uh, it's a fluid API. And it's awesome that, that the Spring Framework 5 ships with the reactive uh, core. And we saw the reactive template and repository introduced in Spring Data Cache Base K, and then um, a reactive web application using um, the Spring Web Flux and Spring Data Cache Base. Uh, Spring Data Cache Base is now uh, fully Java 8 uh, with, uh, uh, with K version. And we also have uh, other cool features like uh, DDF projections, Java 8 time support, other generation of IDs, and Colin works uh, support as well as works. And we have the uh, links for today's demo and uh, other um, Spring Data Cache Base K stuff on the links for that on the side. So I think we all have to as well. So um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Let me uh, okay. also mention. Uh, Sorry, Peter. <laughs> no, go ahead, uh, please. I, don't uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, we would we really want your help, and so now is a great time. Uh, we're in uh, milestone four on Spring Data with K. We've been working uh, closely with uh, Pivotal on uh, getting K to this point. It's getting really close uh, to a release candidate, and as Peter mentioned earlier, releases uh, coming up uh, to be imminent. And so this is an opportunity for you to, to jump in and uh, let us know what you like, uh, what, what could be better, uh, and uh, you know, where should we go next. Can't promise that we'd get it into this release, but it's always good to have uh, feedback uh, for, a, uh, for the future roadmap. Um, the other thing I'd mention is that if, uh, if, you, if this is the first time you've heard about Couchbase, um, and you're interested in more information on Couchbase in particular, there are a couple of events coming up uh, in person, so uh, Couchbase Connect Europe is going to be in Paris in September, uh, and then uh, Couchbase uh, Connect in Silicon Valley is uh, coming up in fall 2017. Uh, and we'd love to get uh, both uh, people, uh, you know, telling us how they're using Spring Data and Couchbase, uh, as well as um, you know, just uh, if you want to learn more, uh, by all means, uh, come come on out to that. Awesome! Yeah, that'd be great. Um, didn't realize you had a, a conference locally here. That's uh, that's fantastic in the Bay Area. That's great. So, cool. And um, yeah, you know, I think you know, as a function of the work you've been, the, how closely you've been working with the Spring Data team. I mean, you know, there's there's this problem, right? Where you know, if if you're working on a reactive front end, but you don't have a, you know, database driver, you know, or you don't have a system that's reactive end to end, you're you're really only as reactive as as the sort of, you know, where wherever the weak link is, right? Um, yeah. And uh, you know, you, you you know, you you can have a you can have a reactive front end, but you know, if you're if the integration, you know, server you're using isn't reactive or what have you, you know, it's uh, uh that can that can be a problem. So I think um, you know, it, of of the many people that are on the webinar today, if you are thinking about, you know, reactive in the near future, uh this is probably one of the most developed uh, solutions with, in terms of having a good reactive driver uh in the NoSQL space that we've seen. Um, you know, great, uh, great starting point um, to, to choose Couchbase. I think if if you're considering reactive backends um, for uh, for your reactive Spring frontends. Um, yeah, Peter. I haven't, uh, haven't seen, Peter, haven't seen anyone else come close uh, to the work you're doing yet. Yeah, to to your point, uh, uh, Josh, both Josh Long and, and Christoph uh, Strobel, uh, two two of uh, Pivotal folks, when they would would go out and talk about why reactive. Frequently, actually, they would talk about uh, Couchbase's architecture and the, Couch, the Couchbase client and the fact that we have these capabilities, but there was no good place to plug them in. And now we're um, so there are a few other uh, talks out there uh, that you can see where where they give uh, their uh, their reasoning why why Reactive is the right way for the future. Yep. Yeah. No. Totally. I think it's great. So uh, we do have a couple questions coming in from from the audience. Um, one, just a very simple one, uh, was curious if you're having any events. Uh, in in the Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles area, I know we did. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say we did just a few weeks ago. Uh, it might be more like uh, six weeks or so ago, and then there was a meetup earlier this week. Uh, um, I I uh, um, I don't know of one off the top of my head. 
but if you'd like to, uh, by all means, follow up, I'm just Matt, M-A-T-T, at catchrace.com, and uh, send me a quick email, and I'd be happy to uh, uh, get you to the right uh, folks who would have the full calendar. You're lucky. You have, like, the easiest email in the entire world to remember. It's so <laughs> simple. Um, <laughs> that's great. Um, hey, so, folks, uh, as, you're, as we're doing some of the question and answer, this is a really good time to click on the attachments and links section of your user interface. Uh, that is where you're going to find links for uh, some of the demonstration code that you've seen today, uh, as well as some, you know, additional additional information that's uh, relevant to, to what's going, you know, the stuff that we've been talking about here in the webinar. So, because uh, when the webinar closes, those links will disappear. So, as we're continuing to do the Q&A, uh, go grab those and bookmark anything that you, you want to keep. Um, okay, so, uh, back to the questions. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Um, do you plan to integrate the sync gateway with Spring Data? Hmm, good question. Yeah, so uh, for those uh, who, who aren't aware, Spring, uh, uh, sorry, not Spring, Sync Gateway is uh, Couchbase's uh, interface for building mobile applications. So we actually have a version of Couchbase called Couchbase Mobile that runs embedded in iOS or uh, Android uh, devices or uh, even um, uh, if you're building on uh, Xamarin, so you can write C-sharp code and and run on those. So at the moment, uh, there is, uh, there's, uh, so well, there's a, a different way to maybe answer this. Starting in the not too distant future, uh, we've done a lot of work to kind of bridge the gap between applications that work uh, with uh, Catchbase Server directly and those that work with Catchbase Mobile. The reason for the difference historically was we needed to handle certain things like authentication, and uh, there's a slightly different model in a database where you can modify a document in any location. Uh, so, but with the um, Starting with Catchbase Server 5.0, we actually have a feature called uh, Extended Attributes. And both Spring Data and Catchbase Mobile will be using those extended attributes so you can cooperate on the same set of data uh, in the future. Uh, so it won't be Spring uh, Framework directly against Sync Gateway. Instead, it would be Catchbase Lite using Sync Gateway and uh, the Catchbase Spring Data uh, implementation also using the same bucket underneath, uh, and then you'd be able to collaborate on the same data. Uh, that's, a, that's a future, but it's coming up uh, here really soon, probably uh, in uh, late Q3 or early Q4 of this year. Awesome. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, that seemed, that seemed like a, somebody jumped right to the front of the roadmap there. Um, okay, so uh, uh, next question is, does Spring Data Couchbase write data to the primary and read from the primary from default, maybe they meant by default, I'm not sure. Um, how is the failover handled essentially at the Spring Data level? Uh, okay, yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So um, in Couchbase, I'm, I'm going to take the term primary to mean uh, not using uh, a replica. Uh, so if you're uh, new to Couchbase's architecture, uh, every um, Every node in a Couchbase uh, cluster has a set of services on it. One of the primary services is called the data service. It's really the key value service. And Couchbase is a CP style system in, in the parlance of the CAP theorem. So the idea there, uh, I know I'm jumping straight into a, a computer science theory here, but the idea here is that, uh, yes, you do read and write uh, from what we call the active location. So we don't call it uh, primary and replica or, or master and replica. We call it the active location. So Spring Data uh, does write data directly uh, to, the, um, to the active V bucket. Uh, which is the place where that particular piece of data is stored. And it also reads from there uh, by default. Uh, the, there's a slight subtlety here in that if you're doing a nickel query, you could have a covered query, which means that the data is coming directly out of the index. And you do actually have some options when doing a nickel query to define whether you want to be fast or you want to be consistent with respect to any changes that you've uh, written. As far as uh, how the failover is handled at the Spring Data level, so um, not just with Spring Data, um, Spring Data actually has, a, or Spring in general, has some, some uh, unique capabilities here to go beyond uh, what we do uh, straight with Couchbase. But the Couchbase SDK itself, its goal is to give you, uh, like we were talking about with the, the reactive manifesto, its goal is to abstract away a lot of the details of the cluster. 
you know, we can't entirely abstract them away because failures can occur and we need to, to uh, deal with those failures and so sometimes failing fast is the appropriate thing to do. Uh, but in general, if a failure occurs and the cluster does a failover, your application, as long as you weren't accessing that data at that point in time, at the time of the failure, your application doesn't need to do anything special. You don't have to, the, the SDK handles it for you. There's actually an evented way for the cluster to update uh, the uh, Catchbase SDK that uh, Spring Data Catchbase is writing on top of to handle that failover. Um, so uh, I mentioned a unique capability though. So where would you go that step further? Well, Spring has, uh, sometimes you want to, uh, as we were talking about, you might want to do uh, back pressure or you might want to make sure that you don't uh, continue throwing load at a system that is um, not, maybe not necessarily failed but is, is having uh, some sort of difficulty. And there are times that, uh, and, and that might not even necessarily be, you know, a bug in Couchbase, uh, not that we're uh, bug free, but, you know, it could be a, a network failure or something like that that uh, can't keep up with the, the throughput or maybe you've just gone further than your, your required load. And the answer there is something called a circuit breaker. Um, Subhashni uh, and uh, Simon Belay did a presentation on this at uh, the last Couchbase Connect, but you can pull in a component to your Spring application uh, using Netflix's Hystrix library to implement circuit breakers. Uh, so if you needed to uh, slow down the use of a particular resource uh, to make the system very reliable, you can still do that. So the, the, the quick answer is failover is, uh, is handled by Couchbase. You as an application developer don't have to mess around with it. Um, consistency is, uh, for direct document access is always there. We're not reading from replicas. Uh, we have the performance to be able to do that. Uh, and, there, and when you're doing a, a secondary index kind of uh, access, you have the uh, ability to decide between consistent, uh, which would cost more, it would take a little more time, and, um, and uh, high performance. So you have all the options there to be able to build out a, uh, a reactive application. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, and I, I think, I, I, think I, I heard you correctly when you said uh, you're, you're kind of focused on sort of the A and the P, right, in the, in the CAP theorem? Uh, C and P. C and P. Um, C and P. And okay. Sorry. Yeah. Couchbase Mobile does A and P, uh, and, there, and if we do cross data center replication, we actually do A and P, which is where we might have clusters and multiple uh, data centers. Got it. But, um, I, I would uh, argue that CP is the right thing for these uh, interactive apps because you don't have to do quorum reads. You don't have to have the overhead for that. Yep. Okay, cool. All right, thanks. Um, next question. Uh, oh, good. This is great. We've got a, a, a couple more questions to, to, to work with here. Um, can you talk about exceptions and error handling, please? Um, are there ways to retry queries in case of timeouts or errors? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a segue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so um, the uh, answer here is uh, there are built into the uh, client and Couchbase itself, it does actually do a certain amount of retries of where the operation itself is idempotent. Um, for those who, not, who might not be familiar with the term, so-called idempotent operations are the ones that are safe to retry. Uh, so things that won't mutate data uh, uh, are, are that case. So if, for example, the uh, connection were to get dropped, the client itself will continue to try to complete that operation until the timeout value that has been specified by the application. And there's, there's some defaults within the application. Now, that doesn't mean that, um, that you'll be entirely abstracted away from timeouts. Uh, among the um, uh, many applications that we've seen deployed over the years, our number one culprit for timeouts is uh, our friend, the JVM garbage collector. Um, and every once in a while you hit that, that full GC and that'll take a little while. Um, and you could retry those. I would argue in most cases, especially if you're looking after an interactive web application, in most cases you probably want that timeout value to be relatively high. And the way to think about a timeout is actually to think about what would I do next after the timeout? Um, the reason maybe not to do a retry 
would be because if there is a failure uh, or you know some uh, say for example some sort of um, network failure maybe I uh, I have a route I'm going through an alternate route and it just can't handle as much traffic for whatever reason the problem with retry is that you put yourself into a sort of a pathological state right when when the work doesn't get done you're asking for more work from the system uh, so um, that said if it is something that you definitely need to get a response back to the user, you know there's some good ways to handle this. Uh, one is that you can pull this all the way up to the user interface. You can say, uh, so you could handle the timeout, uh, do a back off and retry, and even show the user interface saying, I'm re automatically retrying. You know, something has gone wrong. I'm automatically retrying that request on your behalf. Um, the uh, uh, other errors, uh, and Sebastian, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about this. Uh, so, in the either the template case or the um, um, the uh, reactive um, uh, uh, case, uh, the uh, reactive repository case, uh, you can specify what you want to do with error handling in, in many of those situations, yeah. right? What, what more would you say? Yeah. On that? So you can have them like you can chain them, um, uh, do on error or do uh, similarly how you do on next here. You can do on error, and you can uh, you can either uh, you can either stop the stream or you can you can you can emit a different value or something like that. And the tip trick to get this nice thing where uh, you can you can have uh, the uh, they fall back just in case of uh, for doing retries and so forth. Uh, but uh, with do on error, you need to have your own retry builder. Got it. So, for example, with Histrix, Sebastian, might we just kind of going back to our sample application? We might actually do something like fail back to a cached within the JVM uh, mm -hmm. copy of what the leaderboard was last known to be, if we had lots of requests for that leaderboard, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, next question is: um, uh, Let's see. Is Spring Data integrated with Couchbase Lite? This might be a little bit more of a binary answer. Uh, so the answer is at, at the moment no. Uh, so Spring, and uh, that's pretty much the same answer as: uh, Do we have uh, plans to integrate Sync Gateway with Spring Data? So the difference is uh, Couchbase Lite is the one designed to run on the mobile phone. Um, I don't, and there are so-called hybrid apps, which is where you write kind of using a REST interface, and it is possible to do that both on uh, iOS and Android. Um, but I, I, I'm not uh, aware of any out-of-the-box integration there. Um, so the main focus for us at the moment is uh, for Spring Data for web applications, uh, and then Couchbase Lite, uh, its model to talk uh, directly to um, you know the database there locally, um, but uh, I, it, it might be the same person asking the question. Uh, I very much like to uh, get a, get a better sense of what you're looking for. So if you want to reach out to me, I, I'd appreciate it. Matt at Couchbase.com. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Gosh, that's like winning the you, you won the email lottery, man. That's like that's like getting your uh, Twitter handle's name is Matt. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, another, I, I think you kind of answered this, but maybe there's some nuance here that that you didn't get to. Uh, the question is, how would retry with exponential back off be implemented? Uh, is there any support for retry in Spring Data Couchbase? I think you kind of touched on this already, but yeah, um, I to, to to my mind, and I'm sure Sebastian has a better uh, thought on it, but uh, to my mind, uh, you, you know, usually what you can do is if and this has come up um, you know, occasionally when people are doing things like stress testing, you might get a back pressure exception um, from, the, uh, from the SDK itself. The, uh, in that case, you can actually just uh, uh, implement a do while loop uh, with the exception to do uh, exponential uh, back off and retry. Um, as mentioned, I, I personally would kind of, you know, you so, sort of want to think about systemically what you want the behavior to be in that case. Sebastian, is there uh, anything uh, built in with Spring that makes that uh, simpler? Uh, no. Uh, 
So here you would actually will actually change and they do on error um, and do your own Glee try builder. Uh, yeah, otherwise the, the other option would be to use history. Got it. And okay. his, but his brick okay. has a spring support. Uh, are there, I, I remember from the spring guides that there's a, a document on using yeah, history. There is a spring support. You can use an annotation to do the uh, to add a history free drive. And would the history free drive do exponential backup? Uh, there's also a, a spring we try, uh, which can mm -hmm. uh, I was, which is also I was just about to say that. Can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, with that, you can do the, the number of attempts and how much you want to do an exponential bypass it. And with pitch rates, you get this uh, fail back, like a full back through, and uh, how, how, how long you would, how, how you would want to do a circuit breaker when the circuit should open after how many failures and so forth. Yeah, it looks, uh, I'm just looking at um, spring retry right now. It looks like there is a back off policy interface mm -hmm. that you can extend and implement however you wish. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, apparently we use it in uh, Spring Batch, Spring Integration, a few other places. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of one of the lesser known Spring projects, actually. So. All right. Uh, well, I think we're, we're, we're sort of uh, done with the question queue for the moment. So um, while we're just wrapping up, if you have any last questions, we're uh, happy to answer those. Um, in the meantime, I just want to mention uh, very quickly, um, yes, uh, please do join us for uh, Spring One Platform 2017. Uh, if you want to basically meet meet the Spring team, meet the Spring community, uh, and and you know it's it's really a conference where the leaders uh, and and partners like Couchbase, for example, um, that work with us out in the community, you know, this is really sort of our annual uh, get together. Um, and the interesting thing is that conference has uh, changed where um, we used to kind of have the, the Groovy and Grails community as, as part of the spring conference. Um, we've we're sort of been shifting more towards uh, including uh, Cloud Foundry and, and sort of other uh, things, other open source that comes from Pivotal as well. So it's a really interesting open source conference. It's in December in San Francisco, uh, and we would love for you to join us. Um, so check that out. Um, the other thing just want to mention quickly is uh, this w is being recorded. Um, so I'm just going to put the, uh, the URL for where you can find the uh, replay um, available. Uh, it's at content.pivotal.io forward slash spring. Uh, you will find a bunch of content there that you won't get anywhere else. Uh, like from, you know, there's, there's some overlap with the spring blog, but for the most, uh, for the most part, uh, that contains uh, most of our, our webinar replays that are related to Spring, uh, occasionally um, Pivotal.io content that's Spring focused. So uh, it's a bit of a you know a bit of a Pivotal's take uh, on Spring as opposed to stuff that you find in the Spring blog and the open source website. Um, so a uh, great uh, place for for finding other content as well as uh, these webinar recordings. Of course, uh, if you're a YouTube subscriber, we will publish it to, to YouTube as always. Um, and if you're looking to get your hands on actual software bits, uh, you know, <clears throat> if you just go to the Spring Project page for Spring Data, uh, you will uh, you can get the Maven or Gradle coordinates uh, to get the software. And then, what, what's the easiest way to get the uh, to get Couchbase? Is that a Maven or Gradle thing, or you just do a direct download? Uh, it's a download since it runs as a process. So uh, Couchbase.com/download. Got it. Okay. Uh, that's I. I figured, but it wasn't wasn't sure. So, okay, great. So that's that's how you can get your hands on the actual bits here, folks. Um, and yeah, um, if you know, <clears throat> excuse me, if um, for some reason uh, you need Spring bits and you're you know behind 20 layers of proxy servers, or you're on a military network or a closed network of some sort, um, you can get HTTP downloads uh, directly from our Artifactory server. Uh, our nightly build server, which is at repo.spring.io. Uh, if for some reason you're you're really stuck and you can't use Maven, Maven or Gradle, uh, we got you covered. It's just you know not quite as easy to figure out um, uh, uh, as as Maven or Gradle, but um, and we don't recommend it. But if if you're desperate, you're desperate. So um, 
I uh, think that covers everything. Um, we'll be announcing next month's webinar very soon. We don't have that uh, on the books just yet, um, but uh, we're going to be you know, continuing to work our way around some of the interesting things in Springwork Framework 5.0. Um, uh, so um, keep an eye on this. Subscribe to the Spring blog or, us, or, or uh, check out Spring Central on Twitter uh, if you want to kind of stay abreast of, of uh, what next month's topic is going to be in future. Uh, future topics and, of course, lots of other great information. So uh, with that, um, Subhashini and Matt, uh, anything you would like to kind of say and to wrap up in summary uh, before we call it? Uh, just we'd love to get your feedback. Thank you so much for the time, Peter. Uh, it's been a, a great uh, great project to work on with uh, Pivotal, uh, with uh, our ex-colleague Simon and, and others, and we look forward to really getting the reactive stuff out there. Actually, you know, sorry. Uh, I normally I would I would say goodbye at this point, but one question did come in, um, and since we have a couple extra minutes, um, would it, would it be all right? Do you want to want to address? Yeah, that? I'm here okay, for great. you guys. All right. yep. <laughs> yeah, right, right on. Sorry, uh, just it just popped up a second ago. Um, basically, it was uh, inviting you to finish your comments on the sort of the fate of Rx Java usage within Couchbase, and I, I thought it was interesting that he asked that question too, because from what I can tell. But uh, you know, Ben Christensen from from Netflix is no longer working on Rx Java. Um, some of the main Java Rx Java committers, like David Carnock and others, are are working pretty steadily with the Reactor team. Um, you know, what what is going on with Rx Java in general, and does that affect the fate of Rx Java within Couchbase? Yeah. So the uh, and and uh, of course we've been uh, very closely tracking what's happening with Reactor. So the the in the near term, uh, meaning between here and our next major version, uh, you know we follow a um, we follow a semantic versioning uh, approach. So we don't want to we we're not going to abandon uh, Arc Java One in the near term because we need existing applications to work. What we're currently thinking towards, and I'll, I'll uh, you know, uh, lean on Sebastian to uh, correct me if I misstate anything, uh, but what we're currently leaning towards is that uh, the Reactive Streams uh, standardization process is, is actually really good for us in that uh, we think we can take our existing Reactive core. We're probably, what we're looking towards at the moment is we're uh, kind of looking at RxJava 2, not so much because we want the Rx Java 2 interface, but uh, based on that, we can through Reactive Streams then uh, uh, expose to you the developer either a Reactor interface or an Rx Java 1 interface uh, for backward compatibility or an Rx Java 2 interface. Um, that's uh, that's that was a, a fresh discussion from uh, just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, so uh, that's that was our our current thought. Um, so from a, from a user perspective, uh, you would uh, have a number of options uh, depending on just which uh, jar you import. Did I say that correctly, Sebastian? Is there anything more you would add on that? Yes, uh, we're looking more towards uh, creating a Reactive Streams publisher in the face for a code and exposing Rx Java 1 or Rx Java 2 uh, on each other find itself. So. It would be easier to work with any other uh, Reactive Streams uh, implementation. So. Yeah, probably the better way to say that is that we're shifting to doing the standards interfaces, and then it then it doesn't matter necessarily uh, which uh, reactive programming model you're using on top of that. Uh, so, uh, and then we'll have choice of implementation underneath. Uh, so, um, you know, we're we're excited to see. Um, uh, a lot of other uh, folks come to, come together and you know moving forward on the reactive manifesto. Great. Hey, listen. Thank you so much for your for your time and preparing this uh, content today. While you know you're trying simultaneously to uh, write, you know work on the product. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Really, really appreciate your time and your energy that you're putting into on this. And just you know, I think it's great to see. Um, you know that there there is just a, a really good no reactive NoSQL backend option out there. You know as we're coming to market with with Spring Framework 5's reactive story for the first time out there. I think it's you know there there are other options of course, but you know I think I think this you know this is is clearly one of the, sort of the most mature uh, on on the reactive front. So it's it's just great to have that kind of real uh, you know 
real sort of tested, uh, well-designed, been working on it for some time, didn't just start a month ago type of stuff, uh, ready to go for people that are, are you know, wanting and needing this stuff and are left sort of with the other 70% of this audience that was more exploratory, you know. Um, so, yeah, uh, wonderful. All right, well, um, look forward to, you know, maybe having you at, uh, at Spring One, Matt, and, and Subhashini, and um, look forward to uh, having you back in the webinar program again soon. Sounds great. Thanks much. Yep. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Take care.